Thanks to Brilliant for supporting my channel. I read Andrew Nigg's PhD thesis. If you're new here, I'm Jordan. I'm a PhD student at MIT who makes videos about AI, emerging tech, and grad life. And I want to start off this video by saying that the inspiration for this style of video is Toby. Her channel is Teeb. She does a ton of videos that are up this alley. So all credit to her for the inspiration for this video. The other reason why I'm doing this video and why I've been reading PhD theses in general a lot more these days is because I'm a fifth year PhD candidate and I've been interested in seeing what a thesis actually looks like at the end of the day. It's interesting just to see like where people came from academically, what they were doing when they were in my shoes however many years ago, but it's also kind of helpful <laughs> as a current PhD student to get a better understanding of what the end goal of what I'm doing, what I have been doing for the last four years, what I will be doing for the next two years actually looks like. And also helps kind of lower the bar a little bit because I think a lot of PhD students, especially if you're at a place like MIT, come in and think that your grad work is going to be this groundbreaking thing that's going to change the world. And at the end of the day, most people's PhDs aren't. So if you're not familiar, who is Andrew Nigg? He is one of the most influential people in AI. Um, he works in deep learning, machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, machine perception. And he did his master's at MIT actually, um, and then did his PhD at UC Berkeley, looking at reinforcement learning for autonomous systems. He also published one of the two papers that are credited with independently discovering a method called LDA, um, which is a dimensionality reduction method that is used to discover topics within data sets in fields like natural language processing. Initially, after his PhD, he became a professor at Stanford. He was leading one of the first labs that really pushed people towards using GPUs for model training, which was not necessarily a common thing before that. He also worked at Google for a while. He co-founded Google Brain, if you've ever heard of that, Google's deep learning project. And then he's been a huge leader in democratizing CS and more strictly machine learning education. So he co-founded Coursera. He also co-founded deeplearning.ai, which is another website that you can go to to learn deep learning. The guy's one of the big superstars in the field. And so I thought that he would be an interesting person to start with if I end up making more videos with other people's PhD theses. Definitely let me know who you'd like me to read in the comments. But I thought that he would be an interesting person to start with just because of how well known he is in the field. So let's take a look at his thesis, which was entitled Shaping and Policy Search in Reinforcement Learning. And so his thesis primarily focuses on developing usable reinforcement learning systems that can account for real world uncertainties. Anyway, the first chapter of his thesis is basically an overview of reinforcement learning, a comparison between reinforcement learning and supervised learning. As a general rule, the first chapter of most PhD theses is generally more about context and expectation setting. It's kind of like the introduction to a paper. So a lot of this actually, if you're interested in reading through it, is pretty accessible to the general public. He actually even says it at the beginning of the chapter. We have an informal non-mathematical overview of the reinforcement learning framework that we will consider in this thesis. We also describe some of the issues in reinforcement learning that we will try to address and give an outline for the rest of this dissertation. So the second chapter is also very context setting forward, but it focuses more on actually more mathematical definitions. So the second chapter focuses on reinforcement learning and Markov decision processes. And so I made a video a while back on basics of what reinforcement learning is. I will probably do an updated video sometime in the near future, but you can check that out because I won't be getting too deep into the specifics. So as he says in his thesis, this is actually a pretty straightforward definition. Markov decision processes or MDPs provide a formalism or a formal mathematical structure for reasoning about planning or acting in the face of uncertainty. And so the idea is that you essentially, it's, it's comparable to like, a game board, not necessarily a monopoly because that's a pretty linear loop, but maybe something like a game of life where there's a set of possible actions that you can take at each space and then there's a probability that you will from one state go to another state. So there's a probability that at a fork in a road you will go either right or left. 
And of course, in a video game, if we're thinking of the game of life, the goal is to get to the end and max out the cash that you have so that you can retire to the biggest mansion. And so essentially within MDPs, there's also a reward function that tells you how much of a reward you get based on the decisions that you make throughout the process of going through each state based on the actions that you choose to take. The underlying idea here, which I get into the reinforcement learning video, is that unlike a lot of supervised learning tasks, a lot of deep learning tasks, in reinforcement learning you typically make a lot of decisions. So chess is the example that's usually used. You look at something like AlphaGo. You make a lot of moves in chess and the reward is whether or not you've won. It's, it's a pretty binary reward, but you don't know until you've made a ton of moves beforehand. And you also don't necessarily know going in which move might have sealed your fate in terms of winning or losing. And so the idea is how can we develop solutions to things like Markov decision processes or things like reinforcement learning problems that allow us to maximize the reward we get at the end by making different decisions or choosing different actions that move us to different states. And then the main difference between a Markov decision process and a partially observable one is that in a partially observable MDP, your agent, the thing that is moving from state to state and that is taking different actions, may not be able to fully see all of the factors that might contribute to a decision to take a particular action. So it may not have access to all of the data that it would possibly need in order to make the correct action, and you have to figure out how to create a solution that allows you to still optimize your reward under that circumstance. So getting into the fun stuff, chapters three and four I think are the most interesting part, at least for me. Chapter three focuses on shaping in reinforcement learning, and so this Actually, the idea behind this, if you've seen my video on specification gaming or essentially what happens when an algorithm learns the letter of the law and not what you actually wanted it to do, this is this work looks at ways of getting around that. So one of the examples that he gives in his thesis is a paper from Randolph and Alstrom, which describes a system that learns to ride a simulated bicycle to a particular location. And so to speed up the learning process to incentivize the agent to make the correct choices. They essentially provided more rewards whenever the agent made progress towards that particular location, which led to the agent just riding the bicycle in tiny circles near the actual location that it was supposed to go and just racking up rewards points that way, which is not what you actually wanted your model to do. And so the idea here is that we already have a reward function in our Markov decision process and we can essentially add a separate function that might disincentivize certain types of actions. And so in the example of the bike that just rode around in circles, we might add an extra formula that disincentivizes riding in circles by saying, you know, you don't get a reward if you move or you get a negative reward if you move one step next to each other in a circular manner. There's probably a better way of saying that mathematically, but I couldn't think of a better way of saying it in normal English. He essentially goes through a bunch of formal proofs of how you can use shaping to make a better reward function that improves the outcomes of your reinforcement learning model. And I think that because he finished his PhD in, I believe, 2002, it's just really interesting to see <laughs> how it's interesting to see the origins of things that we're still talking about now and also see like the initial thinking, but also how we're still using a lot of these approaches and a lot of this thinking to try to solve similar, if not more complex problems. Chapter four focuses on a method called Pegasus and essentially what he's looking to do here is address the curse of dimensionality. And so if you've ever taken any kind of machine learning course, you've probably heard of this term. Essentially what it means is that if you have a state space that you're trying to work through, so a set of states that your model is trying to work through, the cost of representing that problem scales exponentially with the dimensions of your state space. And what that means is that you can design smaller RL models or Markov decision processes and not necessarily worry about the time and complexity that it will require to solve the model and find a solution. But as your problem gets bigger and there are more states you have to explore, it gets exponentially harder and slower and more complicated for 
for you to actually find the solution to that problem, and it also makes it less likely that you will ever arrive at a solution in the first place, which is obviously not ideal. And so the method that he proposes here is policy search, which it's so interesting to read this here because policy search is something that I think I first came across in one of the earlier OpenAI papers looking at proximal policy optimization. And this feels like, you know, it was the beginning of that time when policy search was a new thing that no one was ever talking about. And now it's the only thing that people talk about when it comes to reinforcement learning. So it's super interesting to see that this is where that came from. Um, so policy search basically constrains a set of functions that can represent the solution that you're looking for to certain types of functions. So often what we use is a neural network. Um, if you have prior knowledge of what a solution might look like, you might base it on that. But the idea is to constrain the space of solutions that you have to search through so that you can more efficiently find the actual solution that you're looking for. And so once you have that set of kind of guess functions that you think are in the realm of what your solution should look like, there are a couple ways that you can actually estimate the reward function to get a sense of which solutions work best. One that he brings up is Monte Carlo sampling. Um, this only really works if your original MDV is deterministic. So if it always outputs the same thing for the same input. Um, stochastic is when there's more randomness involved in your output. And so a lot of MDVs aren't necessarily deterministic. A lot of them are stochastic. Um, and so decision trees are the other option that he brings up that allow you to search a decision space more efficiently without necessarily needing to worry about having a deterministic function associated with your model. Last but not least, the last chapter focuses on autonomous helicopters. So can we apply what we've learned so far to flying autonomous helicopters, flying helicopters autonomously, having them react in what is a partially observable space, making sure that the helicopter stays stable in the air based on wind blowing or a leaf falling or something like that. Something I didn't know that isn't a machine learning thing, uh, but that I learned from the thesis is that apparently RC helicopters have the added challenge of leaning in one direction, which is to the left, due to how their helicopter was designed. And so you have to factor that into the algorithm that you developed. I, this feels like something that should be over on like real engineering. I did not know this, but I thought it was interesting. And so in short, using all of the things that we talked about in the earlier chapters, him and the team that he works with, Stanford had an autonomous helicopter project team that was working on this issue. Uh, were eventually able to develop an algorithm that was able to keep an autonomous helicopter stable in the air. So in terms of takeaways, I thought it was super interesting to just read a thesis of someone who's such a big name in the field and to see that what he did feels a lot more accessible than I think anyone would necessarily think coming from someone who's so well known for doing such groundbreaking work. I think part of that is just a time thing. It's been 20 years. <laughs> since he wrote this thesis and submitted and, and defended his PhD. And so a lot of the stuff that's in here is stuff that I remember learning in like an intro to machine learning course. Um, and so it's not necessarily as novel just because when he was writing this, he was establishing these things as fact and now they are established fact. And so it's not as surprising. As I mentioned before, I would also love to dig through more people's PhD theses. So if there's someone that you'd like to see me cover, let me know. If you'd like to see me get into more detail, I can also try to do that. That will take a little bit more time on my end. Uh, one of the challenges that I definitely ran into in this paper is that real analysis is not my strong suit and there are a lot of proofs <laughs> in this paper, but I can do my best. And so if you want to dig through the PhD theses of researchers like Andrew Nig, but need to brush up on your machine learning skills first, I'd highly recommend checking out Brilliant who are kindly sponsoring today's video. Brilliant is a visually stimulating and interactive tool for STEM learning built on the principle of active problem solving. They have an ever-growing catalog of courses in math science and computer science that are designed to help you gain a deep understanding of STEM topics in a low pressure environment. In fact, Brilliant has an awesome introduction to neural networks course that will leave you ready to build a neural network or understand the work of some of the researchers who led the field on deep learning yourself once you finish. And if you're worried that you might not have enough time, don't worry. Their courses are broken down to bite-sized sections so you can learn by doing whenever you have time. To get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash Jordan or click on the link in the description and the first 200 people to go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Otherwise, you can follow me on my various socials to keep up with my PhD life and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.